It's truly a, a pleasure to welcome uh, Elliot Ackerman uh, back to Politics and Prose. Elliot is someone uh, who, like the, um, the author and filmmaker Sebastian Younger has said, has served his country twice. First as an infantryman in our nation's wars, and then as a literary guide who helps us understand what we've done. Or, as the writer Andrew Solomon called him, Elliot is a man of both action and thought. Elliot experienced the U.S. wars in Afghanistan and Iraq firsthand, serving five tours of duty during eight years as a Marine. He earned a silver star and a purple heart for his actions leading a rifle platoon in the second battle for Fallujah in November 2004, and he won a bronze star for valor while leading a Marine Corps special ops team in Afghanistan in 2008. He has said the experiences he had fighting were the defining ones of his life in his 20s and early 30s. Later, taking up journalism, Elliot covered the fighting in Syria as a civilian for several publications, and he started writing books. He told an interviewer that he always felt like he wanted to have a life driven by purpose, and his purpose evolved into being a writer. His literary, his literary career has, has had a, a truly prolific start. Since 2015, he's come out with three acclaimed novels and now a memoir, Places and Names. His first work, Green, uh, his first work, Green on Blue, is a powerful, lyrical, poignant war novel set in Afghanistan and told um, very unusually and, 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 and really interestingly from the vantage of an Afghan soldier. His next book, Dark at the Crossing, begins on the border between Syria and Turkey with an Iraqi American who wants to cross into Syria to fight against Assad's regime and meets up with a couple who are refugees from Syria, a former revolutionary and his wife. Described by Elliot as the story of a failed revolution told through the prism of a failed marriage, the novel was a finalist for the National Book Award in 2017. Last fall, he came out with Waiting for Eden, turning to the war on the home front. It's another story about war, but it's also a marriage drama and a tale of friendship, duty, and failure, narrated by a ghost who speaks to us from beyond the grave. In Places and Names, Elliot offers a real-life accounting, but writes with the same urgency, passion, and attention to detail that made his novels so compelling. Uh, and with the same penetrating examination of the meaning and costs of war. He does this through a series of essays as he travels to conflict zones, old battlefields, and, and refugee camps, attempting, as he's explained it, essentially to place the war experience at the center of a circle and then look at it from, from different angles, from Elliot as a young soldier to who he's become as a journalist and writer, to even meeting in a Turkish refugee camp with a Muslim fighter whose actions mirrored his own when both battled on opposite sides in Iraq. The result is not only an intensely personal book about the purpose and impact of war, but also a meditation on the larger meaning of the past two decades of America's ill-fated involvement in the Middle East. Now, Elliot will be in conversation uh, here this evening with David Ignatius, who's becoming kind of regular for us in moderating uh, different events. You know, David, David, whose regular columns in the Washington Post are, are a must read, um, not only for, for valuable insights into national security affairs, politics and economics, but also for the news they often contained. Two years ago, it was David who first reported that Michael Flynn had spoken by phone several times with the Russian ambassador shortly before the Trump administration took office. And last year, in the wake of uh, Jamal Khashoggi's murder, it was David who provided some of the most revealing information about Jamal's past and about the feuding inside the, um, the Saudi royal family, stories that were part of a team package that made the Post a finalist for the Pulitzer for Public Service. Plus, David's a terrific writer of spy thrillers, the latest of which is The Quantum, is the, the Quantum Spy, copies of which uh, are available uh, also this evening uh, back towards the checkout desk. And uh, David just um, just uh, told us that he's uh, uh, near finishing work on, on his 11th novel, so, so stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elliot Ackerman and David Ignatius.
Thank you, uh, Brad. Um, it is really a, a, a pleasure. I want to say really an honor for me to be able to do this event uh, with Elliot, uh, whose service to the country, whose bravery uh, in combat, um, uh, Brad described, uh, and the country is honored with these remarkable decorations. And now whose uh, gift as a novelist and in this book, a writer of nonfiction, I d deeply admire. Um, there's a quality about Eliot's writing, a spareness, a concision that uh, I think is what uh, good writers aspire to. So it's wonderful to have this chance to talk with Eliot. We're going to talk for about a half hour and then we're going to invite people to ask questions from the audience, so please be thinking of, of your questions. Elliot, I want to um, begin with the subject that I, I want to say haunts um, this uh, new book, Places and Names, which is war, as the subtitle says, war, revolution, and returning. And it's, it's the returning part after uh, experiencing five tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan, you returned to the border of Syria to observe the conflict that was going on there. And you have a remarkable passage about our uh, colleague, who I'm going to say is missing, uh, Austin Tice, uh, who, like Elliot, was a Marine uh, and who, like Elliot, wanted to, to write about a conflict and smuggled his way into Syria and, and disappeared. Uh, and we still believe at the Washington Post he freelanced articles for us, um, is, is still alive. And we uh, pray that he'll, he'll be uh, released. But Elliot writes at one point, I never knew Austin Tice. I'm sure he went to Syria for many reasons, but I imagine he missed the war in the way I do. So I want to ask you to begin by just explaining to, to all of us what that means. I think, you know, one of, one of the things, um, you know, I lived in Istanbul for three years and that was sort of the perch from which I was uh, covering events in Syria and then later in Iraq and traveling around Istanbul, you know, there's a pretty vibrant expat scene there, of journalists and uh, photographers, uh, humanitarian active aid activists. And, and when you kind of picked at the surface of any of them, you would find if they were of a certain age, 30 plus, that they kind of had these antecedents in Iraq and Afghanistan and had spent time there. And so one of them was a guy I met, a former uh, Marine infantryman named Vince. And at one point Vince says to me, you know, I kind of look at him and he was teaching English in the Gulenis school in Istanbul. I started to look at him and he was sort of this far out guy who, you know, flew over at one point to be part of the protests in Tahrir Square in Cairo and was kind of living this very bohemian life in Istanbul. And I looked at him and I just sort of said like, what are you doing here, man? At a certain point. And he said, he said, you know, I'm, I'm here to be close to it, as though the it didn't need any justification. And I thought about what he'd, what he'd said for a long time, you know, what is this it? And to me, I would say the it is an experience that is so large that when you stand proximate to it, you kind of lose yourself in that experience. And um, again, I didn't know Austin Tice. Uh, I don't know why he went to Syria, but I suspected it was to also sort of be lost in that it. And uh, one thing that really struck me was when you go to his Twitter account, which is still active and has his last tweet on it from many years ago, his profile says, you know, you, you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares also into you. I um, mean, it was that idea of, of, of getting lost and in some ways missing the war and the sense of purpose that it would give you and people coming back to try to find that same sense of purpose and meaning. So let me ask you a question um, that I, I think probably could be asked of any uh, veteran. How, given that uh, fascination, that desire to be there and, and return there, how, how do you uh, escape that? How do you distance yourself enough from that to have a good life with your wife and children? I think, you know, listen, the thing that, that interests me about war and why I write about war is not because I'm interested and have some, you know, fascination with tanks and machine guns and want to fetishize that type of stuff. The thing that interests me about war is that in many respects, it's an endeavor you can go to to understand the whole range of what it means to be a human. Because you see humanity at its most extreme polar ends of depravity and cruelty. 
And you will often see it as well at its most extreme ends of heroism and empathy and the things that we do for one another. And one of the facets of that is understanding what sustains us as people. And I would argue one of the things that sustains all of us and allows us to function every day is our individualized sense of purpose. You know, why, why do we get up each morning? Why do we do what, I, what we do? And oftentimes, I'd argue most of us are kind of, we live for each other, whether it's our family, our friends, our children, you know, we live for each other. And in the wartime experience, you see people are living and fighting for each other. That's, you know, that's been my experience. That's why most people are, that's why most people are fighting if you ask them why they're there. And so oftentimes when I think of how you come back, it's you come back from the wartime experience by learning how to live again, by learning how to find your purpose again. And the people I know who struggle to come back the most, um, although, you know, there's PTSD and, you know, nightmares and things like that that occur. And it's very real. So I'm not sidelining that. But the thing I've seen that's more insidious is the people who come back who just struggle to find a sense of purpose that compares to the one they had when they were maybe in their 20s in the war. And uh, What do you say when you when you encounter a, a vet who's really struggling to, to, to find that purpose, sense of place, place to stand? Do you are are there basic words of advice that you offer? How do you try to help that person? I think it, I think it would depend on the person. I would think you know it depends on the person and what their what their challenges are. But I think you know the one thing that's nice uh, about being a veteran is there are you know you're you're part of a community of veterans. But I think one of the things that's been a challenge with these wars is you know these most of our wars I would argue if you look in this country were generationally defined. Uh, I, I would say. Probably people in this audience would agree with me that the Vietnam War was generationally defining. The Second World War was obviously generationally defining. You know, I think if you look at this most recent set of wars, the 9-11 wars, they weren't generationally defining. So, you know, as a writer too, you know, you have these ideas of, you know, being part of, a, you know, one that might say, like, are you, you're part of a lost generation, right? We have that, those literary traditions. So the guys I know uh, and some gals who are writers, you know, we sort of will sometimes laugh and say, you know, we're not really part of a lost generation of writers. We're kind of like the lost part of a generation. Um, and I think that has been a challenge um, in these wars and has made them sort of interesting mutations of our wars in the past, both that you know, fewer, fewer of us have been affected by them and been involved in them, and the fact that they've gone on so long, which we haven't seen before. One of the, um, the extraordinary passages in this book is where you, uh, a, a veteran of having fought uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq, in Iraq, uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan, encounter um, a, a, a fighter along the Syrian border uh, who you call Abu Nasar. I don't know if that's his, his or Abu Hassar. Abu Hassar. Abu Hassar. Um, and and uh, this man quickly volunteers that he was an al-Qaeda fighter in Iraq at the time that you were there. And maybe you can uh, pick up the story there and, and tell uh, folks how you came to be honest with him about your own experience. You were not a humanitarian worker on the border. Tell us, tell us how you leveled with sure. him about who you really are. You know, I'm one of the through lines in this book is a series of conversations I have with uh, Abu Hassar over a period of about three, three to three and a half years, I'd say. Um, and I started going to southern Turkey because a, a, a friend of mine who'd spent a lot of time in Iraq and Afghanistan as a humanitarian aid worker was now picking up and going to southern Turkey to, to, to deal with the crisis there. And he basically gave me an invitation to stay with him and some of his colleagues. And they had hired a number of Syrians who were from what was then a quickly expanding diaspora. One of them was a guy named Abed. Uh, and Abed was a, a very urbane uh, man from, Dam uh, from Damascus, uh, had worked at the British consulate for a while. And he was working with my friend Matt, the humanitarian. So one day Abed comes in um, from a day out in the field. It was probably 8, 39 at night. And I'm sitting in the office slash house we all lived in. And I'm sort of making dinner at the stove. And he comes in, dust on his clothes. And he goes, and he's like, ah, Elliot. And I'm like, oh, hey, Abed. I was like, well, how, how was your day? He's like, I had a very interesting day. He's like, you know, I was in a chocolate refugee camp. And a chocolate refugee camp is right on the Turkish-Syrian border. It's actually bisected by a set of railroad tracks, that, that town. So the southern part of the town is Syria. The northern part of the town is Turkey. Because I was in a chocolate refugee camp today, and uh, you know, I, I I met someone I I really think you should meet. And I said, okay, Abed, like, who's the guy? And he said, well, he fought for Al Qaeda in Iraq, but I just feel like the two of you are really going to get along. <laughs> so, 
you know, sort of being up for everything, Abed and I talked it through and we're like, let's go meet him. And I said, well, you know, what do you think I should tell him, Abed? Should I, should I tell him like, you know, I was a Marine and I just want to hang out. And uh, he's like, well, I don't know if that'd be a great idea. And we, we basically two have said, listen, why don't we just tell him that you were in Iraq before that back then you were a journalist and you just want to meet him and let's just see how it goes. And if you guys, you know, have a little rapport, you, you can tell him that you were a Marine. And so we sat down and we met and we started talking and Abu Hassar started ex- kind of explaining what he'd done in Iraq. And he had run guns and fighters over the border from Deir Zur in Eastern Syria into al Anbar province in Western Iraq, where I had, had fought. And, um, you know, as we start talking, I'd say after about half an hour, I kind of looked over to Abed who was translating for the two of us. And, um, you know, I said, what do you think? You think we should let him know? He said, yeah, I think you can let him know. And so Abed translated, you know, Elliot was actually, you know, we're sorry. He was a Marine, you know, please forgive us. And Abu Asar just sort of leaned back and he smiled and he said, don't worry, I figured as much. But he knew that. And the reason he knew it was probably because, you know, I, in going to meet him, made this gamble in that, you know, when you're at war, you're sort of like engaged in a bit of a dance with your adversary. And you know that they are defining you. They're defining your movements. They're defining your behaviors. And you do that for many years. And it's very natural, right, that you kind of get curious about who you're engaged in this sort of shadow dance with. Like, who's your partner? And I had that curiosity. And that's why when Abed said, I think you should meet him, my reaction was like, absolutely. That sounds, that sounds great. I would love to do that. And that meeting was predicated on a bet. And that bet was that Abu Hassar would have the exact same curiosity about me that I had about him because he had been defined by me just as I had been defined by him. And that was really where we sort of found our common ground. There's a, a, an amazing uh, conclusion to this first revelation that y- you both were in this war trying to kill each other uh, that involves a map uh, of the uh, of the kind of Western uh, part of Iraq. Just describe sure. it. That's a wonderful scene. Well, so, I mean, there, there are two moments in this meeting that were kind of little, little epiphanies for me. Um, so I thought we would speak for about an hour. We wound up speaking for about four plus hours. Sort of everyone, you know, sitting there drinking tea, eating baklava, hanging out. And at a certain point, um, Abu Hassar you know, we have these areas of commonality, but he would frequently slip into these sort of bits where he is going through this kind of Islamic, radical Islamic dogma that he still very much believes in. And um, as my friend Abed is translating this, I can see how irritated he's becoming having to translate this to me. As I mentioned, he's a very urban guy from Damascus. He was an activist in the revolution in 2011, 2012 in the peaceful protests. And I can see he's getting irritated. And what sort of is obvious is that, you know, Abed had gone out into the streets really with a pretty irrefutable cause through peaceful protests to demand democratic reforms against an authoritarian regime that oppressed his people for decades. Like you kind of can't argue with that. And he had seen his cause completely knocked off the railroad tracks. He can't ever go home again. His country is in disarray. And when I'm sitting there, what I realize is the forces that have led his country in this total disarray are kind of manifest by Abu Hassar, the jihadist. And so I see that irritation. Then as I'm sitting there, I'm I'm also very cognizant of the fact that, I know it's not fashionable to say this, but I remember what people were talking about in this town in 2001 and 2002 and 2003 and the reasons why we were going to Iraq. And one of those reasons ostensibly was to bring democratic reform to a country that had known nothing but an authoritarian for decades. And we were obviously doing it through very different means, but you know, I had gone to the Middle East to try to do what Abed was trying to do. And um, sort of strangely, Abed and I kind of had gone through this same arc of disillusionment, at least with that cause. And we're strangely, the more we talked, the more we became close friends, realized that we were kind of veterans of the same war. But to get specific to what you're talking about this moment with the map, so there's a moment after about four hours where Abed is like, guys, I've been translating for four hours. Like, I need to just take a break. I think, you know, I've got to go to the men's room. We've been drinking all this tea. So um, anyways, he gets up and leaves. And now suddenly it's like me and Abu Hassar, and we can't talk. And we're as awkward as like two 13-year-olds on their first date. You know, I'm like kind of staring at my hands and, you know, looking around. And Abu Hassar takes a sheet of paper from me. And from the top left corner to the bottom right corner, he makes a wavy line. And it's the Euphrates. And he writes the name of a place and he puts a number next to it. And he hands me the sheet of paper and gives me the pencil. It takes me and I'm like, oh, wait, I get it. 
And so I put a number next to his number. Then he does the same thing, a place name with a number, and I put a number next to his number. And sort of as we once chased each other around the map, our hands are, or as we once chased each other around the country, our hands are chasing each other around this map. So what we're trying to figure out is if any of our numbers match up. And if any of the dates matched up, if we had ever been at the same place at the same time fighting against one another. And what dawned on me was, you know, at that, that moment was a, was a moment that Abed couldn't have translated because Abed hadn't been there. And it was a language that Abu and Asar and I shared, whether we liked it or not. So it's, it's a very powerful scene, uh, as Elliot tells it in, in, in the book. I want to ask you a little bit about the substantive question of these wars. Uh, so many years of war, so much frustration. And let me take Syria um, in particular. The, the devastation of Syria as a country, the devastation of the Syrian people has been excruciating to watch. As a journalist, I've covered it. I felt so strongly back in 2012 about wanting to understand what was happening that I smuggled myself into the country, a really reckless uh, action on my part. But I, I came away thinking that the, this revolution that you're describing of people like your friend Abed uh, in the streets against a really dreadful regime was something that we should help, not by saying army in, but by trying to help the people who wanted to fight that. Uh, it's a, you know, now so many years, seven years later, and the country's just one charnel pit. Um, as you look at Syria, drawing on your experience of Iraq and Afghanistan, what's your judgment about the, what the United States should have done in 2012, 2013, when Syria still seemed to hang in the balance? You know, one of the wraps on Barack Obama's presidency will always be that he didn't enforce the red line, uh, that he, he let American power appear to be weak uh, and let all those people uh, die in places like Aleppo. What do you think? Well, I would preface what I think saying that, first of all, I, I subscribe to Socrates' wisdom, which is I know that I am wise because I know that I know nothing. And that these are very, very don't become a columnist. I'm not. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Um, you know, and that these are, ex, you know, that these are extremely difficult issues that are never clear in the moment. That being said, I mean, looking in hindsight now, yeah, I think there was probably a moment in 2000, later 2011, 2012, where a certain type of assistance could have made the difference for the Free Syrian Army, um, and that moment passed. But, you know, we have to think about, like, the context of that moment. You know, in 2011, that was when Barack Obama had ostensibly ended the Iraq war in advance of the 2012 election, which itself was a bit of a gamble. That stability there would, would hold through the 2012 election. And that, you know, you want to think, talk about things that went wrong in his watch, I would say that was one pulling all the troops out of Iraq because you wound up with the, the rise of ISIS. But, uh, you know, I think fundamentally um, the... In, you know, inside Syria, you know, the biggest the biggest thing I observed there, too, is just the, you know, the, the abject heartbreak people felt of seeing their revolution go off the rails and knowing that they can never, never go home again. You know, and that's something I try to, to track in the writing. One of the really interesting puzzles for historians um, will be the one that Barack Obama wrestled with, which is whether there was an option short of all out. Uh, military invasion that involved uh, the use of our intelligence uh, service, CIA, uh, and something known as the ground branch, the paramilitary part of the CIA, to train um, Syrian fighters who wanted to preserve this revolution uh, to, try to, to try to succeed. And Obama hesitated and, you know, he said to have asked for a study from CIA, you know, these things never work. These covert actions, they never work. Now, um, it's okay to, to take this into the, the next space, I, I'm trusting. So uh, not part of Elliot's extraordinary biography is that, is that after serving as a Marine and winning the Silver Star and the Bronze Star, he, he became a CIA paramilitary officer. 
And so uh, Elliot uh, is a uniquely knowledgeable person. I'm not going to ask you with respect to any specific thing, but I'm going to ask about the larger question of training people who want to fight in a place like Syria and whether our intelligence uh, officers have the ability to do that effectively in your judgment. Well, I think there's the the question of war by there's this question of war by proxy. I Meaning, can you train people up to fight a war that we might be reluctant to commit U.S. ground troops to? And that's not only our intelligence services; it's also our special operations services. And we've done that to some extent against ISIS with uh, you know with the the Peshmerga and the YPG in northeastern Syria. And I would say to you know to relatively decent uh, effect. The question is, could you have gone into Syria earlier to do that in you know, non-Kurdish areas? Um, and who's to say? But I think that the, the, the trap we often fall into is the belief that the, the tool is the policy. The tool only works if there is a sustainable policy. And um, you know, again, I'm always hesitant to to, to look in hindsight because I remember what I was thinking. I, you know, I remember after the, the Hauta uh, sarin gas attack that's mentioned in the book when we were talking about the red line spitting at a bar with an old marine buddy of mine and I think that was August of 2012 and I remember looking at him and saying you know what if we send the first marine division into Syria man like I don't know about you I'm going to put on my old desert cami top with my medals sort of Ronnie Kovic style and I am marching on the mall like this is crazy we cannot start another war in the Arab world and then a year later, you know, I'm kicking around, you know, the southern border, hanging out with guys like Abed, who are these democratic activists, and they're looking at me being like, our entire revolution, everything we wanted to do, you guys didn't show up. We thought you were going to show up, you didn't show up. And looking at them, and, you know, feeling a lot of conflict in my heart about, you know, what was the right thing to do? Um, so listen, do I, do I think, yes, we have capabilities in this country, and if we have a coherent policy and we employ those those capabilities, you can often see good results. I think with our intelligence services, a lot of the time you get a bad rap because we only know a lot about their successes. I mean, there's a great there's a great they're, book. Their failures, I or, think. Sorry, their failures. Sorry, you know the great book, uh, you know, Legacy of Ashes. That our intelligence agency has a Legacy of Ashes because all you ever hear about are, are the ones that fail. So I just would I'd make a, a a point, which is also a question. Um, as I mentioned, I traveled in the, in the West and saw the disarray of the rebel forces that I wish we'd helped uh, in, in, in Western Syria. I've also traveled a lot um, in Eastern Syria with our special forces that have been uh, working, as you said, with the Syrian Kurdish fighters, but then a much broader coalition. And as, as much a failure as our policy in the West has been, our policy in the East has been a success. Uh, ISIS, a genuine menace, has been absolutely crushed on the ground as a caliphate. And to see how that happened and the motivated, I guess that would be my, my question to you. Would it be a, a, a rule that you would endorse that we should be only get ourselves committed in these situations where we have genuinely motivated partners and allies? Well, um, yes, I think it's important to have genuinely motivated partners and allies. Um, is that always enough? You know, I don't necessarily know. You know, in the book I write about going, I go back to Fallujah um, to visit it. And I had set that trip up with a, a friend of mine who was the uh, uh, Baghdad bureau chief for the New York Times. And, you know, he basically told me, hey, yeah, just come on over. It's not a big deal. We can get you in and out of there. I've got all my fixers in place. You know, we'll be all set, no worries. And I, I set that trip up and we were going to go. And then uh, either fortunately or unfortunately, the Mosul offensive kicked off. And uh, I remember I was flying out that evening and he sent me an email. I said, hey, man, I'm sorry. Like, we're all going up to Erbil. Uh, you can stay at the house, have fun on your trip and let us know if you're coming to Erbil. And so I landed in Baghdad, fortunately had a backup fixer who, who got me in and wound up going to Fallujah, revisiting and then going up to Mosul um, to, to travel along for some of the offensive up there. And in both Fallujah and in Mosul, being with some of the now we're in 2016, being with some of the Iraqi counterterrorism uh, units, two things really struck me. 
Um, the first was I would go around and I'd sort of do my best like Ernie Pyle as I would talk to them, kind of be like, you know, where are you from, Sarge? <laughs> and, you know, to a T, as we're rolling into Mosul, these guys are all like, where am I from? I'm from Baghdad. And they would have their flags, their, their Shia flags with the Prophet Ali riding from their armored gun trucks that looked just like our armored gun trucks. And the other thing that struck me was how extremely well trained they were, how efficient they were, how when I interviewed the Iraqi counterterrorism forces who'd fought in the third battle of Fallujah, um, they would talk about their tactics. It was all stuff I recognized. And when you would finish talking to them, you'd be like, I, and I'd ask, like, so, so what do you think is going to happen, guys, you know, when you're done in Mosul? Or what do you think is going to happen now in Fallujah? And they'd be like, I don't know. Someone's got to figure out how to rebuild this place, and it's not us, and the Fallujans are all angry at us. And what dawned on me is we'd done this remarkable job. We had, after... What, 15 years of war created a perfect image of ourselves in the Iraqi forces. So much so that they were confronting many of the problems we had, which is now how do we rebuild? How do we build trust with these local populations who if you're that Shia sergeant from Baghdad rolling into Fallujah, you might as well be, you know, you're as foreign as a kid from the 1st Marine Division in many respects. But but we're going to take that as progress that uh <laughs> The tank now may I have how to, upbeat you are. <laughs> well, you, you have to struggle for a, a, a glimmer. So I want to ask you one more um, question before I turn this over to the audience. Um, and that is you're now a, a journalist, um, uh, at least some of the time. I'm, I'm a you're novelist not a, who dabbles in journalism. Okay. Uh, me too. Um, so I want to ask you how you think journalism as a profession has been doing in covering these wars. And I want to ask you in particular whether you think it has been beneficial or harmful to our readers that we have embraced the idea of embedding with U.S. soldiers in war. I'll take the first half and the back half of that question. Um, I wouldn't say that it's harmful to our readers that w that journalists embed with U.S. troops per se, but I think it's important to also have journalists who are not embedded with U.S. troops, just so you can see a variety of perspectives. I mean, as a reader, that's what I would like to see, um, not just not just one perspective. So, um, to the second half, in terms of the you know the status of conflict journalism and what I've observed, you know, sometimes I'll bump into you know younger writers who are starting, and you know, the little bit of advice I give them is I say, you know, it's sort of like. Uh, uh, it's the best of times and the worst of times in terms of doing this type of journalism. Um, it's the worst of times because if you think you're going to kind of go to the Columbia School of Journalism, throw out a few resumes, and then you're going to be the, you know, the number two man at the Istanbul Bureau for the New York Times, like it's probably not going to happen. There are very, very few of those seats left. Um, it's sort of the best of times because if you are – young and willing to sleep on a sofa and buy a one-way plane ticket to an interesting part of the world and you can write and you start filing your dispatches and you're there, I would imagine probably more so in 20 or 30 years ago, you know, you can be writing for the New Yorker in six months. I mean, one of, can I just figure out, and one of my favorite journalism stories uh, of a writer is, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Ben Taub, who writes for the New Yorker now. He's a great writer. Um, I don't know Ben, but um, his story is he was on The Voice and was on the voice television show it was a, a phenomenal singer uh made it pretty far along then got voted off the voice took his prize money and started going to turkey and started filing dispatches he wrote for the daily beast for a while and his stuff got picked up with the new yorker and now he's a staff writer for the new yorker and you know there are a number of those stories so i say it's sort of the best of times in that many of the barriers to entry have fallen away it's uh one i just note if there are any in the audience a caution um, given what happened to Austin Tice, um, given the the danger that people who want to be journalists will will take, the risks they'll take uh, in doing just what Elliot described, we have become very, very careful about encouraging people to do this um, bootstrap thing because, you know, if, if something terrible happens to them, we do feel a responsibility if we've encourage them or, or publish their their material. Um, I'm just going to say one more thing before I turn it over to the audience. I'm looking at Trudy Rubin in the audience who's covered an awful lot of uh, conflict, combat as a journalist. And I'm remembering, Trudy, something that, that Elliot just isn't going to believe, which is how back in the old days in Lebanon, we would get 
press cards from all the different militias. You know, that was the time when people wanted us to come tell their stories. And journalists like me and Trudy had a kind of white flag that we carried. And we would literally go through combat lines, cross siege lines. I mean, there'd be enormous artillery bombardments. We'd find our way around them and get to from side to side because everybody need, there was no internet. They couldn't, we were the way that they would communicate. And so um, there's a way in which, um, you know, d direct social media has made life very difficult for, for me and Trudy. Well, I will say one thing, uh, and I write about this a little bit in the book, a lot, of, a lot of my stuff I've done for Esquire magazine, and it's great being up on the front when you're trying to get access to it, and you go up to you know, whomever it is who you're trying to let you get to the front line, and they say, who are you with? You say, I'm with Esquire magazine, and they don't know what Esquire magazine is. <laughs> you say, we're a men's fashion magazine. I need to get up there. <laughs> So let me invite people to come to the microphones. As you're doing that, I'm just going to say one more thing about the book. Um, you need to read all the way to the end because Elliot includes at the end of this book the verbatim transcript of the commendation that was accompanied his Silver Star. And if you want to read what uh, the face of war and heroism in war is, uh, that's a, a place to start. It's just extraordinary to read it. So, uh, yes, sir. And we'll go, if people want to line up the other microphone, that's great too. So thank you both for this very interesting, uh, interview and thank you for all the work that you've done. Uh, my question is about Afghanistan. So it's a really easy question. <laughs> so in 1973, president Nixon talked about, um, peace with honor in Vietnam. And I think the strategy was to teach the South Vietnamese to defend themselves and exit. So can we have peace with honor in Afghanistan? Yeah, I, I think we I think we certainly can and and hopefully should. You know, I think well, you know, when I think back on the last fifteen years and like the 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 great strategic blunders of them, um, I say the most obvious one is probably Bush never should have put the troops into Iraq. For sure. I'd say a second one vis-a-vis -vis Iraq is I think, I believe, Obama shouldn't have pulled all of the troops out of Iraq. And the third one I would put into that trifecta was uh, in after 9-11, very closely conflating al-Qaeda with the Taliban, which I think showed a lack of understanding on our parts as to the motivations of those two groups, al-Qaeda being a transnational terrorist organization, and the Taliban, although not being particularly nice guys, being much more Afghan nationalists. And, um, and I think that probably set us back a long ways into figuring out how to get out of that quagmire. And I think, you know, at, at this moment, um, yes, there is a path with peace, with honor. So um, there's a question at the end. The question at the end of this is, um, <clears throat> this is the first, the first, these are the first wars we've had that are fought by volunteers. Uh, my father was in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, he got a bronze star. He also got frostbite, which is the only reason I'm here. Uh, mine was the Vietnam generation, and and th it was the draft that ended that. Um, 35,000 more American deaths to get the honor that we left Vietnam with. But this is a, these are, these are different kinds of troops, and you've only seen that, but you've seen all of it. And I wonder what you think. Does it make a difference? And what difference does it make when we have an all volunteer army? Well, I think, you know, 2019 marks a really mo interesting moment in American history and one that I think is kind of going largely unobserved, which is that this year marks the first time in our history that a young person can go enlist to fight in a war that is older than they are. So that's never happened before. And so it's probably worth asking ourselves, why is that happening? And Every American war, if you go all the way back to the Civil War, has had sort of a, a construct of how we've organized a fight. The Civil War saw the first draft and the first income tax, right. you know, Second World War, war bond drives, the draft, Vietnam, the very unpopular draft you alluded to. And these wars have been fought by an all-volunteer military uh, and funded through deficit spending. So we haven't felt it. And as a society, I think we've been largely anesthetized to it. And that is why, at this point, it has gone on for 18 years. So I think... We are in a position of moral hazard. It's become very easy to go to war now. You know, personally, I'm concerned as we you know we see uh, 
torpedo strikes in the Straits of Hormuz and all of the issues with Iran and before that North Korea, that if our perception of society of what it means to go to war gets morphed, where war is kind of a relatively painful thing that this small segment of the society we don't interact with does, then, you know, we're primed to sleepway our, sleepwalk our way into a major war that would be far more catastrophic than what we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan. But I think these are questions that are, are, are worth asking. And I would agree with you that, you know, were there a draft going on today? The war would be over tomorrow. It'd be over tomorrow. It'd be over tomorrow. I mean, look, look at the college admissions scandal. Look how crazy that drove parents. Imagine if all of those parents had a one in, in a one in 100 chance that their kid would be un, involuntarily toting a rifle in the Hindu Kush. I mean, this thing would be over in two seconds. <laughs> Thank you. So just I want to follow up on that uh, momentarily. As you say, Elliot, there's a way in which a relatively small number of people have been uh, fighting these wars. And you can see how guilty the rest of the country feels every time you go to a ball game. And there's a moment where, you know, pretty much any professional sports uh, gathering, uh, there's a moment where, where – the announcer will ask the crowd to turn and 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 uh, and applaud the wounded warriors, the veterans there, and you know there's it's just become a ritual. It's so different from after Vietnam. If you see guys in a, in, a, in uniform in a train station, even people stop and sometimes and applaud. I've been on airplanes where people will you know. Um, my question is, is this sort of national f- guilt feeling? Now, everybody, I'm sure everybody, you probably hear 10 times a day, Elliot, thank you for your service. Um, does that begin to make you mad that, that there's this people from this other tribe who were saying, you know, thank you, you know, the distant uh, tribes? Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't make me mad. I just, but I think that it's, uh, it's just endemic of the fact that we are in, we have developed over these years, what I would say is a dysfunctional relationship with our military if we are what we profess to be, which is a republic in which when we go to war, we should all go to war and or should it should touch us all in some way. And kind of taking that and subcontracting it out to a very specific part of the population, it's just not healthy for us. I mean, one of the things that you'll often see like in Stars and Stripes or in other, you know, some other newspapers, they've run a few stories where it's been like, uh, the, then they're sort of supposed to be positive stories, but it's like great story, father and son from the 82nd Airborne serving together in Afghanistan. I'm like that's the most depressing story I've ever heard in my life. You know, like they shouldn't be serving together. Um, and so, again, I think that we are just in a moment uh, and positioning ourselves uh, in a place of moral hazard with how we engage with war. And it's worth asking ourselves these questions. Sir. Yeah. So having served in IDF in the reserve for many, many years, you know, my experience is far from being nostalgic. I don't want to, to, to think about it. So and of course, when you're IDF, you defend your country. So when you went to, uh, to Iraq and Afghanistan, were you told that you're going to defend your country? What were you doing there? Well, I think that the there's two things. You know, there's the policy that you're going there to enforce, and then there's a personal decision of whether or not you want to serve. You know, and for me, I wanted to serve for a variety of reasons. I grew up outside the United States. I uh, I think that just gave me a little bit of a perspective of what it meant to live in this country, and I had this desire to give something back. I wanted a job when I was 23, or whether I was good at that job or bad at that job really mattered. You know, I didn't want to go make photocopies somewhere for the five years after I got out of college. So I wanted to serve. Um, you know, and lastly, I was someone who was always interested in the military. So that all sent me into the military, and I joined the military in 1998 before September 11th, and the wars happened, and um, I still had that desire to serve. And then, um, and you know, even going to Iraq, I didn't necessarily think the Iraq war was a good idea, but if the war was happening, I wanted to know that I was there to contribute whatever I could to the immediacies of, of that war. I mean, but, you know, specific to how I feel about the war, I mean, it's interesting, you use the word nostalgia. You know, a lot of people, since you come back, they talk about issues like, you know, PTSD. And we had this conversation about purpose before. Um, and they didn't always used to call it PTSD. You know, the, and they used to call it shell shock. In the Civil War, they used to call it soldier's heart. And if you go all the way back to the beginning, uh, when they first started talking about these, these issues in the Napoleonic Wars, the Napoleonic Wars, they just actually called it, uh, your word, nostalgia. 
And so I think it's that idea of just, you know, of, of thinking about, you know, a time that was uh, very impactful to you. Um, but th those are some of the reasons I served. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trudy, Trudy. Oh, young man. No, yes. Question. You got to. Um, uh, did we really have to um, get so angry at the Taliban just because they blew up the twin towers? I don't really think that um, we had to do that. I mean, war is the worst thing. Like, if someone could end more, they would probably do it because it's like the number one thing pretty much everyone hates except Hitler. <laughs> Thanks, Ethan. That's a good question. You know, I don't, I don't know if we necessarily had to have the wars go on so long, but I remember after September 11th, and I think in Afghanistan, we had no choice uh, but to go respond in some way, as imperfect as our response was. Um, but probably the Iraq war, uh, we didn't necessarily have to do. Thanks for the question, buddy. Good question. Um, Elliot, I'm wondering, what is the impact on the military of not only the repeated deployments, but fighting in these wars that go on forever and don't end. Um, and also, it, do you feel that these are the wars of the past and the future is going to be totally different when it comes to warfare? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it's tough to say monolithically what the effect is on the military because the military turns over a lot. So, I mean, you do have people in the ranks who've been there since the beginning, and then you have the, the turnover of 19 and 20 year olds. Um, but I think one of the things that's been unique to these wars, and, you know, and I think for the people who fought them is because they've gone on so long, anyone who has served in them and then left uh, has sort of had to declare, you know, the peace, peace hasn't been declared. There's been no end. There's been no a signing ceremony on a battleship or helicopters off the roof of the embassy. So everyone who's left has sort of had to like declare their own separate peace. And that can be complicated and that can often mean, you know, looking at the guys you served with who are all getting ready to go on the next one and saying to them like, hey man, like I know you guys are going, but for a whole variety of reasons, you know, I'm, I'm done. Um, and I hope you understand. So I think that's, that adds a level of complexity to <laughs> not only the, the service members experience, but then also the veteran experience after that. And, and do you feel that um, these are the last of those wars? wars? No, but I also feel that these are probably, that the next war is not gonna look like these wars um, because it never does. Sir. Uh, you talked about in hindsight, the decisions that we made, uh, how it affects um, you know, today. But one that comes to my mind is the disbanding of the Iraqi army. Um, did you see, in terms of losing that sense of purpose in your experiences uh, overseas, um, did you see that sense of purpose manifest itself in kind of uh, the modern day insurgencies? Uh, uh, thank you. I said three great strategic blunders, and you, you've given me the fourth that I overlooked. So um, yeah, I think that was. Listen, I think you know one of the you know one of the challenges I think anytime we go to war is into Trudy's question. You know, we have these concepts of what a war should be. And you know, for good or for ill in the United States, I think our sort of Ur story is the Second World War. Now, I remember when I was in high school, I had a copy of the Iliad that they handed out in class. That's one of my favorite copies I've ever read. The front cover was just a photo of a bunch of uh, soldiers hitting the beach on June 6, 1944, and it just said, the Iliad. And, um, and World War II sort of is our American Iliad. And to that, if you look at the Iraq War, the sensibility was, you know, we'll be greeted, we'll be greeted as liberators, as though this was Belgium in 1944. And, and also with that, we have, to def we, have to, uh, we have to disband the Iraqi army because, and all Ba'athists because they're like the Nazis. And, you know, we had to get rid of all of the Nazis. And, um, you know, it showed sort of a facile understanding of all the intricacies of that society, what it actually truly really meant to be a Baptist, and it let us, I think it let us down, uh, it, let me raise it, it certainly didn't help the insert, it certainly didn't help the counterinsurgency that we had taken all of these military age males and thrown them out onto the street uh, without a paycheck or a way to sustain their families. Uh, I, I, the, uh, yes, sir. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, you joined the Marines because you were interested in the military and you wanted to serve. And you ended up serving for five tours 
Was that a shock to you? No, uh, it wasn't a shock to me. And I think it goes back to this idea of, um, you know, per- someone having to make their separate piece and that, you know, this, you know, it's an all consuming world that you're living in and the people you're serving, whether you're your very best friends and the war is going on. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the closest thing I could, I could, uh, the closest analogy I can make is it's, you know, it's like being in World War II and you're a Marine and your group of Marines are going to go land on Iwo Jima next month. And you've already done two landings, and you look at them and be like, "Hey guys, sorry. I mean, I'm 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 uh, I'm beat. I want to go do my R and R. You know, you don't say that, so you keep going. And um, but if you do want to leave at a certain point, you do have to say that, and that's mm-hmm. and that's complicated mm-hmm. uh, in a way that maybe it wasn't uh, for for previous generations. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'd like to make a a comment to the audience here that this man <laughs> served with the Marines for five tours in combat, he earned the Bronze Star and the Silver Star. And sure, he gets comments, thank you for your service. This man is a genuine hero. He's a big hero. And I think we ought to give him a big hand for that. I think that's that's as good an ending as we could have. Um, people, uh, I'm sure, will want to get Elliot to sign their books, and you should uh, queue up. Uh, and uh, Elliot will be here at the table. Elliot, thank you so much. Thanks, David. Thanks. For-